Hello, let's see if everybody can also hear me. Okay, good, good. So I think I'm gonna wait just one more minute. Um, in the meantime, if anyone is interested to fetch the slides, this link, the link is this link. Wow. Uh, stream time to XSS. The slides don't contain much, but they have some links that you might be interested in. Okay, so I think I'll now start. Um, so I'm going to move myself away from the link. So you can get a glance of it. And now I'm gonna start for real. Okay. First of all, welcome to the stream. If you are going to drop me the stream or you want to have a takeaway from the stream, please let it be this one. The takeaways are in the first slides. If you want to stop following now, you can. These are the takeaways. When you code, use templates that support escaping, that is four main things and one optional but very good to have thing, automatic, strict, contextual, mandatory, and type enforced. Those are the five things that you're looking for in a templating engine. I will describe what they are and how you achieve them uh, later on. Um, make sure that you control who writes to the response writer, regardless the language that you're using. N make sure that there is only a small and inspectionable bit of code that you can look at that writes to the response writer. And everything else just uses this central funnel. And then as a safety net, make sure that you, to use uh, content security policy and trusted types on your site. Um, I plan to have uh, one podcast episode next week in which I'll go in depth on these concepts and um, I'll have a guest and I'll confirm it uh, in the future. So let's get now started. If you're interested in to understand everything that I just said, let's dig in. An XSS is by definition um, cross-site scripting. That means very little because there isn't much cross-site going on, but the importance is on the scripting. And it consists in being able to run, to run code in a victim's session. Basically, if I am the attacker, I can craft either a link or a page or anything that when visited by another user um, will run code in their browser. So there is no code execution on the server, is always on the client of a victim. And usually victims get to the attacker site by either clicking on a link, which is why you should never link, uh, click on a link on an email that you don't trust. I mean, one of the reasons, or by just visiting a website. Now, let's get to the code. Um, today, I have a simple application. It's called Secret Book. And basically it works this way. You log in, you don't have to register, you just decide a username and a password, and the website is going to accept it if it is new. Um, after you log in, you have a public space with notes. You can put notes for yourself that everyone else can see. Other people can leave a note on your page so that you can see them. And then there are private notes that only you can set and see. So you can imagine these as a bit of an um, extreme simplification of what most um, social media pages are because like in Twitter and Facebook, you can leave posts so that someone else is notified to see them and you can watch your own live stream, your own timeline, and you can see your posts. So more or less a simplified version of these. And also this is how basically every web application works because you have your data, some sort of public data that everyone can access and people can modify and see each other data. So I'll give you an example. So the left person is going to be called uh, one Bert. 
because that's a name. And I'm going to pick a password for them. And I'm going to call the second one to Bert. And I'm going to pick another password, four letters. I mean, I could have checked for password security, but this thing is so insecure that it doesn't really matter. Um, as you see, one Bert can now create a note that I will call note title. And this is uh, the note body. And I'm going to submit. Now, as you can see down here, I hope everyone can read. Um, the note has appeared. Now, if from two bird, I visit one bird page, I see the note down here. So basically, this is how it works. And as two bird, I can leave uh, another note. And I can say like, cheers, and add my signature. There is a nice button that says for one bird by two bird. And then I submit. And now if one bird reloads, here it is, another note. Very simple. This is the streamlined works of the application. That's it. There is no much more logic. Now, how would an attacker test this stuff and um, see if there are vulnerabilities or how would one abuse this? Well, the first thing that one can check is inspect this page and look where this stuff ends up. Now, the inspector view is too small. So I'm just going to tell you this is just plain text that ends up being in the page. So if I, as Tubert, leave another note, and in this case, I leave like, um, let's say, exploit. And I write like script alert document cookie script. And I submit. You see, something is already happening. When it was redirected to the page, there is a pop up that popped. And this is just one example of issue, but this is not a big issue because Tubert is the attacker and he is writing the exploit. And now if one bird visits his own page, here it is. Here there is a pop up that says, this is your session. Now, why is this a problem? Basically, there is code that Tubert wrote that is executing in one bird's session. So now that I got his uh, session cookie, I could just take it and send it to Tubert uh, server. And I could just use that session to authenticate as one bird. Now I can show you the logic for authentication, which is here. Let's maybe zoom a bit. Um, okay, maybe so you can see everything. Um, the authentication logic is very simple and based on the session. Basically, it takes the cookie and it validates if the cookie is there and has a meaning. So once you have uh, the cookie for a user, yes, I use Windows for this stream, correct. So once you have um, the cookie of a user, you can impersonate them and do whatever. So no, this repo is not public yet. I, didn't, I did not want to publish this code because it's so insecure that I feared someone would copy it. So maybe I'll, pu I'll publish it in some form, but it's not public. Um, so please don't use this code. But yeah, basically, the entire session management is based on that cookie. If an attacker can get a hand, um, their hands on that cookie, it's lost. It's game over. So how does one protect from this kind of issue? Um, let's see if I have some slides on this. Yes. The protection is HTML escaping. I, I, I think every one of you is somewhat familiar with this. Basically, when there are dangerous characters, um, you encode them and you change them in something that can, um, can be interpreted from the browser um, as what they mean and not the code they represent. Um, 
most templating engines do that. So if you use, for example, uh, Go Buffalo Plush or, or Buffalo Plush, it only performs this escaping. If you use Handlebars for Rust, if you use uh, Jinja for Python, this is what you get, uh, HTML escaping. So let's now take a look at HTML escaping, how it works, and what are the shortcomings of it. Yeah, someone is suggesting that I should just put a warning saying, unsafe code only for teaching purposes, please don't copy. Yes, I could do that, and maybe I will do that. This is probably how I'm going to um, release this code. So, once we are at the, right, the escape, uh, HTML escaping. So, the way that I'm rendering this data, let's make myself reappear. The way that I'm rendering this data is I'm going to create this data structure here and I'm going to just call this function render templates that passes that data to a template. Now, this creates the XSS because I'm just taking data and rendering it as it is. I'm using text template, not HTML template, so there is no escaping going on. So now before I do that, I'm going to call a function that is data.escape. Now, I wrote this function to emulate how most templating engines work. And you can see the function here on the left. And this, what it does is escape as HTML um, every single string that is part of this body. So basically everything will be HTML escaped. So we should be safe according to most, but this is not true. So I'm going to rebuild and relaunch the server with this added escape mechanism. I'm just going to make sure that I save the page. Okay. Now I'm going to reset the state. And again, one bird logging in, two bird logging in again. Uh, no, I don't want to save this password. So same situation as before. Now as two bird, I visit one bird and I leave my evil exploit. And I'm, no, I'm not gonna sign it. I'm the attacker, why would I sign it? Now, as you can see, this already did not pop the alert as before. And if I reload here, this text is now correctly interpreted as text. And this is good because now what was meant to be text is text instead of being code, which is good. But there is a small issue with, a small issue with that. If I log out, and as username, um, pick something slightly different that I noted down because I'm so slow at, at typing, then I'm sorry for you folks that have to watch me type. Um, basically, now we are escaping everything with the same function. And since HTML is very hard, um, it's not that simple. So I'm going to call myself like this. Now, this, I'm going to paste it in the chat, is my current username. And I'm going to set a password and submit. Now, what happens if I take a link to my account and I send it to one bird and one bird clicks on it? So this is one bird watching my uh, page. And now if he clicks on add signature, can you see the pop-up on the top? That is still one bird's session. Now, the way this works is because my escaping is not contextual. So to be clear, let's take a look at the code. The template for this is this. Now it's a little bit cluttered. So I'm just going to highlight that the add signature function is this one. And that's it. That's about it. 
So let's take a look at the slides. This is the promoid context. HTML is not a single language. This is a common misconception. HTML is um, at least six different languages that I can think of plus some. So HTML is the markup part that constitutes the tags, which per se are already HTML, SVG, and MathML. So three different languages with slightly different semantics and syntax that looks like XML, but is not. And then there is JavaScript, Inside it, there is CSS that you can also put inside the style tag. And in this case, this is the issue. Here we have one string that is interpolated in a JavaScript context as a string in an HTML attribute. While instead, we have the problem that um, the rest of the page that we now sanitize and correctly escape, not sanitize, we correctly escaped, um, uses HTML escaping and it works because it's just HTML. So this is the shortcoming of most templating engines. And to fix this is not easy if you want to do it by hand. So let's do it. Now in this particular point, I will change the attribute name to be owner of page JS and user JS, because now I have to escape them differently because they're there in a different context. And in the code that does, that performs the escaping, which is here, I have to now add two more items that I need to render. So JS and JS again. And I need to create these fields because they're not in the database. They're not expected to be rendered. So I need to create more stuff. So I need to copy this. I need to paste it here. And now I need to keep the escaping for the HTML string, of course, because otherwise I'm going to lose half of the important stuff. And I need to also escape as JavaScript string. So I'll need to do template dot JS escape string. And again, here, template dot JS escape string. And here is N. So now I should have addressed this particular issue. Let's take a look because you never know if I log out one bird and log in again and I visit the attacker side, it, as expected, does not pop any alert. I mean, this page is huge and doesn't fit in the screen, but now this stuff has been escaped and doesn't give any problems. Now, as you can see, there are some other issues like these shouldn't display like that. There are some escaping problems because I'm doing escaping by hand. This is all bothersome and it's all too complicated. And also, I strongly suggest to not do this by hand because maybe you change it once and you fix it. But if someone else maintains your code and just, I don't know, refactors the template to, to put it inside an um, HTML uh, tag instead of an HTML attribute, you will need to use a different escaping. So this is a lost battle. You cannot win this. You cannot keep doing escaping by hand. And this is why um, you should use a um, a, a template mechanism that has contextual auto escaping. Most of you know about it. And um, is HTML template, it's in the standard library for Go. So I'm going to remove my manual escaping now. And I'm just going to switch the import for my template to HTML template. And I'm going to um, Um, change this code a bit. This is the code that renders the template. I'm just going to change it a bit so that it doesn't break. So template.html string. And here I'm going to pass this HTML. Now this has now changed the imports and is using the Go standard way of escaping stuff. Um, 
if I rebuild, I hope this compiles. Yes. These should now work fine and I shouldn't have any issues. Yeah, you see it displays correctly. There are no injections, even if I were, even if I were to add a note with a script inside, it wouldn't break, which is great. Um, there are there are also minor issues here, which is like if you do manual escaping, there are some things that you might be missing. Um, I'm going to talk about them a bit later, um, but it is important that you see why doing this by hand is not possible. One example is if I go back to my previous um, handcrafty way of doing this with text template and save all, even if it's, it looked like the XSS was fixed and there was only some minor issues with the displaying and escaping of data, there was still one major issue there that I can show you. If I send someone to visit this URL, which is JavaScript, actually, let's do it like this. I log out and I call myself, in this case, JavaScript, column slash slash, alert, document, dot cookie. And I'm going to send it to someone. Uh, wait, I have to log in. And I'm going to send it to one bird. So one bird clicks on this link. And then if he clicks here, uh, this is not working. Why is it not working? Okay, maybe I got something wrong. Huh. Did I forget a slash? Yeah, I forgot a slash. Oh no, I know what's, what's happening here. This is go and double encoding stuff. Yeah, okay, this doesn't work just by chance, but in other contexts, it would, um, it would work. So just believe me on this. If you do manual escaping, there are many things that will go wrong. And um, one of the most common one is this, in which you have a URL that is a normal URL in some context, like HTTP column slash slash stuff, or a relative URL like slash stuff. And then someone calls themselves themselves JavaScript column slash slash. Uh, actually, that's what I got wrong. I didn't need the slash. Right. So if I here remove the slash and I click here, there you go. There is the exploit. So with manual escaping, you cannot get all of this stuff right. This is what I'm trying to prove. This is why um, some templates engine you should stay away and not use. If you look at the ecosystems that I have found the time to look into, we have Go, which has safe HTML and HTML template, both that support contextual auto escaping. Plush, fast template and quick template do not support it. So either you go by hand and add the escaping they are missing, which is a possibility if you really need that extra speed. Um, otherwise, I would suggest to use something safer. Currently, there is nothing Rust that supports contextual auto escaping. The links in the non-supported uh, parts of the slide are, um, are links to issues that I have hope opened to inform the maintainers that I might want to fix this. And um, in Java and Python, there is uh, SOI or closure templates. You might know it in one of the two ways. Angular supports contextual also escaping fully and React supports it almost completely, but it doesn't escape or, or correctly sanitize uh, URLs. So there is this bit of confusion. Um, now, at this point, if you use a contextually auto-escaping template, you might think, okay, I'm done. 
I'm secure, I'm doing the best part. And this is where, where I think most of Go developers are right now. So I think that most of the applications that I've seen written in Go um, have this pattern. They have HTML template almost everywhere. And they try to um, never write like with uh, printf or stuff like that to the um, response writer. And so it, this is, I would say, a common situation, but this doesn't mean it is correct and it is not. So let's take another look at our application. In my application, I have two functions. One that is called render template that takes template name and some data to render. One that is called render data, which takes just a data interface and will render the base template. Basically, my application has a header and a footer that are the same in the entire application with styles and scripts. And these two wrappers make sure that you only render the middle frame inside the body. So all the templates don't have to share code. This is just one pattern that I have seen. Also, all the XSSs that I've shown tonight and the ones that I'm about to, uh, to show are all XSSs that they have seen in production services. Um, I cannot name the companies that I've found these in, but um, all of these are real. I'm not making this stuff up. I just put them inside the same application, but this is stuff that happens. It's not stuff that is um, uncommon. For example, Mistakenly importing text, H, uh, text template instead of HTML template is extremely common because they have this almost the same API surface as, um, as a library. So if you run go import every time you save, every time you save like any developer that I know does, um, you risk incurring in this issue. And this is why, all right. Uh, you are not seeing the code because there was my face in front. Well, those are the two functions, render data and render template. They just take stuff to render and they render it. Sorry about that. Still have to get a hand a hold on these controls. Now, as I was saying, one good way to avoid this thing is when you load your templates, specify that they are template, well, they, I would suggest that in the same file that, in, that uses the template and imports the template, you declare a variable of type HTML slash um, actually template dot HTML. Now this variable only exists inside the HTML template um, package, if I recall correctly, but there are some in any case. So you can do this. And this makes sure that Go import never fucks up your imports. Um, this is one way. I suggest to use static check instead of other static analyzers. But since we're going vanilla and we're not going to use any frameworks, this is one way to do it. Um, now, going back to, let's see if this still compiles. Let's save all. Okay, this compiles. Now, I'm using HTML template. I should be secure. I'm not, let's see why. I'm one bird and I type a password. And now I am in my safe space. This is my stuff. And now I'm going to go to two bird. Um, actually, no, I'm going to create a user that is called script alert document dot cookie script and I'm going to create it. Yes. Then I'm going to send a link to one bird that I construct to be login and then I'm going to put user equals this. Huh, wait, what? 
give me one second because login let me take a look at the code just to spoiler it a bit the login handler is very simple and it works like this so what this does is it takes the uname, that's what I got wrong, uh, parameter, it takes the password parameter, and then it checks if the credentials are valid, which is a very standard kind of authentication mechanism. Um, so if I set uname and password in the form, and in this case, I can do it in the query form. So uname equals this user and password equals something wrong. Here it is again. Remember that I'm using HTML template and this is just a link that I created and visited. There is no form submission, no weird things. This is still an XSS. So the problem with this is that there is one flow in the application and just one, this one, that generates HTML with a, an sprintf. And then since it needs this link to render, it promotes it to template.html. This is extremely frequent. Like this is one of the most common things that I've seen. There was an XSS even on um, very famous websites that was due to this. People were just concatenating strings or generating strings with a sprint of, and then promoting them to be template.html. And that makes the template mechanism escaping functionality stop working. So basically, if you pass something like that to the template um, system, it will just give up and will not try to escape your data. Um, uh, the main issue with this is that it's very hard to catch. Like if, if anyone, at, someone is asking, wouldn't it be safer to sanitize inputs instead of sanitizing outputs? No, because when you get input, you don't know where it's going to end up in the HTML page in the end. Do you remember in the beginning when I displayed that you have to escape first by JavaScript string and then by HTML string, depending on the context it ends up? So in the slides, it was um, this slide. Basically, when you receive the data, this is also a very common practice that can save you in many occasions, but not every time. Um, when you receive the data, you don't know in which context you're going to display it. So you either apply all the possible escaping and you accept that your page will break or display weird data, or you have to carefully handle um, these things, or otherwise you cannot, um, you cannot do this properly. Um, now going back, we have this issue, which is again, creating this type. Now, the reason why I suggest, um, to use a uh, safe HTML template is not because it comes from Google, but it is because it provides um, type safety guarantees. So what this means is that um, when you construct a template, a template HTML type, or in this case, a safe um, template HTML type, there are only three things that you can pass it. Um, a compile time constant, which cannot possibly contain an attacker controlled string because the programmer had to type the string inside something that came out of a sanitizer, um, something that um, came out from escaping, but it has to be of the right type, or it must be a render of a template. So when a template renders, it gives you a safe HTML uh, type. So you can use it as HTML because it's trusted, because it has contextual auto escaping. This is a small difference, like changing a package um, 
to adopt this thing, if you're already using HTML template correctly, is not that much of, a, of work. Um, some of the libraries that I mentioned before for other languages uh, support it, like uh, Java Clojure support this, I'm sure. Um, and you can just do it like that. So you know when you construct the type that it is safe and you, then you pass around this type at runtime, but you don't care because you know for sure that it cannot possibly contain uh, attacker controlled control data. Now, um, someone is asking in the chat, with libraries like Blue Monday, well, there are two different things. Escaping is when you need to encode characters uh, so that they don't execute at runtime. So in the first example, when I typed less than script greater than, they, what, what the um, escaping does, it converted less than in ampersand LT semicolon. And that tells the browser, this is actually not code. This is just text. This is what escaping is. So it's an encoding of data. While instead, sanitization, uh, which is what someone is referring to in chat, is when you want to leave some tags in the output, but not all of them. So for example, let's say that you want to allow people to specify in a note bold text. So you allow people to specify a B tag, but you don't want them to specify a script tag. And for these, people can use stuff like Blue Monday, and the output of Blue Monday can be safely promoted to um, template HTML type. Beware, Blue Monday is not perfect. It doesn't check for tags balancing, which is one other way to exploit XSS. It's very hard to exploit, but when it happens, you might get some HTML injection. So Blue Monday is the best that I know of in the Golang ecosystem, but I don't think is something to, to trust too much. Now, let's say that we adopt safe HTML template. One might wonder, yes, but are we safe now? Like at this point, I'm using safe HTML template. I'm making sure that um, all the URLs are sanitized, data is sanitized. I use a sanitizer for stuff. There are still problems. And I've seen XSS ba XSSs based on these. First one is the Go standard library passes the, respons the raw response writer to all the, uh, the handlers. This means that everybody can write to it, even with printf, even with just IO write, which means that they can write arbitrary HTML to the response writer, which if it looks like HTML, will set the HTML content, um, content type. So without changing the signature of the standard um, HTTP handler interface, there is no way to be sure that the only thing that writes to the standard uh, to the response writer is a template. And on the other hand, there is DOM XSS. DOM XSS is a um, specific kind of XSS in which the JavaScript code takes some data from the page and uses it and puts it somewhere else in the page. So for example, you could take the window location and edit it a bit and put it somewhere in the page. And if that causes an XSS, similar to what we saw until now, but instead of happening on the server side, it happens on the client side, there is nothing that the server can do. Like you can have all the templates that you want on the server side and they cannot protect you from this kind of XSS, which is one of the reasons I um, try to put as little JavaScript as possible in my uh, applications or use a framework because frameworks like Angular um, take care of this. They take care that all your syncs, all the places where you put data get escaped even on the client side, not just on the server side. So um, there is no way on the server to protect against this kind of attack. And okay, so this was the last slide. Um, I just wanted to say that in the next episode, I will talk a bit about content security policy and trusted types, which are respectively one way to protect your application, even if everything else fails. So CSP is basically a safety net. Even if you put everything in place and, and someone still wrote with printf to the response writer, CSP can help you there. And trusted types that are a way to do the safe types thing that I was talking about on the server side, 
but also on the client side. So before I close this, I just wanted to show you CSP. A lot of people think that CSP is very hard to implement um, and very complicated. Uh, the code that you see on the left side is the entirety of the code that you need to protect your server with CSP and potentially trusted types. Um, there is nothing else. Um, it's very simple. This is actually, I can send links to it or actually I, I will add the links to the slides because uh, this code I, is copy pasted from uh, one library that um, we implemented and published this summer. So what this says is basically only execute trusted stuff. And now if there are any questions, um, please ask. I will upload this code. Actually, this code is already on GitHub, it's just private. I will publish this code and be clear to put in the readme, do not use this code. Why isn't the nonce var equal to random with a four and a zero? Um, <laughs> yes, yes, this makes me think of the XKCD. Oh, Andre, it's you. <laughs> okay, okay. This makes me think of the XKCD with a function that is called random and returns four, and there is a comment saying, this was rolled with an even dice. Um, yes, this is important that the nonce is different in every page render, but this is not hard because it's five, li the la five lines of code that were there in the gen nonce. Um, uh, thanks for listening, everyone. I'm reading some thank yous in the chat. Thank you all. Um, what is the nonce used for? Basically, you put the nonce as an attribute to every script tag that you have in your page. So if you have a script tag, you instead of having just the SRC attribute, you also have a nonce attribute, and that must match whatever you put in the header. So if we go back to the code, um, let's see if I can zoom a bit. No, I reached the maximum zoom that VS Code can support. Amazing. So basically, these nonce in the header, which in this case is just a random base uh, 64 string, must match the attribute in every script of your page. This is easy because if you're using a template engine, you just pass it once as a, in the data attribute. And this makes it so if an attacker manages to add a script tag in a page, they cannot guess the nonce. And the browser will only execute scripts that have the nonce. So this is basically one of the best way to make sure that even if you make a mistake, it doesn't get executed. It's still a bug, but it doesn't get executed. There is no encryption here. This is just a check, it must equal. Yeah, this is um, clever stuff and it's every, if everyone is, everyone, if anyone is interested in knowing how CSP works, uh, what is behind this, what was the reasoning that brought us to this spec or what everything else in this header means, the next episode I will have a guest, which is Michele Spagnolo, which is a colleague of mine, friend of mine, and he worked on the specification, the current specification for CSP. Um, so we can dig a bit into it and understand what is behind it and how fun it was and what are the browsers that actually support it because this is actually a problem with many features like CSP and trusted types. So I guess if there are no more questions, I can close the stream now. Thanks everyone for listening and for watching and till next time, see ya. So
there was a question and I'm going to answer it with this way rather than typing. So um, what is the best tool to test for XSS? The best tool for, to test for XSS manually, I think is the Chrome uh, dev tool um, because that's probably the best way. That's what I use. Um, some people um, use Burp um, to manually test for it. It's also good Burp suit. There are others like Zap, Pro um, Zap Proxy. Um, automated is hard. Like there is a talk by Claudio Criscione uh, uh, in Google that talks about automating and testing at scale for web vulnerabilities. It's very hard because you need to instrument a lot. You need to um, have a, a br an instrumented browser that visits the page because, for example, DOM XSS, you can only see uh, on the front end. You need credentials to be inputted in. You need to make sure that the tool doesn't destroy the server because sometimes automated tools can crawl too much. Uh, you need to discover the pages. Um, the spider in Burp is pretty advanced, um, but the XSS scanner I've never tested and never tried. Honestly, I think that um, I'm not the best person to answer this question. So um, I cannot answer this. I see there is another question. Okay, why, is X why XSS vulnerabilities are still so frequent in your opinion? Well, if you've seen like my stream today, there are many things that you can get wrong, even if you use the right templates, there are still many things that you can get wrong. Then people do not know that they need to use contextual auto escaping. Like when I started being a developer, I had no idea about this. And even when I started being a security engineer, I only had some ideas about this until I really understood it. So I think that the best answer that I can give is ignorance, but do not take this as an insulting or bad thing. Ignorance as is, to be a developer, you need to know so many things. You need to basically know the en entirety of everything that you need from front end to back end. Also, um, many people now need to know a bit of both. And also there is the part of Docker that you need to learn. And those things are necessary for your work, while security is not. And um, this is a big fault of the security engineering in general, because I think we fail to communicate to developers um, how to properly do this, and there is no one else communicating it to them. And when I develop stuff, sometimes I have to look for these things to see how to make them secure, because even I don't know. I mean, I know web, but, but I don't know other stuff. And even in the web, sometimes I have to Google for stuff because I know I have to search for it. So I would say that the main reason is that people don't know. And many libraries out there, like almost all the templating libraries that I've found, um, don't support contextual auto-escaping. So lack of libraries, lack of knowledge, um, and a lack of communication on the security side, I would say.